Good evening. I see we have, can you hear me? Yes, I see we have a few people still entering tonight. It's great to have all of you here. I'm Sarah Bloomfield, the director of the museum, and we're delighted to be hosting this event in partnership with the March on Washington Film Festival. Tonight, we have a remarkable film about Jewish refugees from Nazism finding their way to America and to teaching positions at historically black colleges in the Jim Crow South. Their experience under Nazi racism shaped their unique perspectives on American racism. Before we see the film, I wanted to share with you something that is only indir indirectly related to the film, but I think it's very interesting. Something that was happening at the same time this film is taking place, but not in the American South, but in Nazi Germany that sheds light on how the Nazis viewed American racism. I'm sure some of you have probably heard the saying that when someone has a big idea and it's their only idea, you should beware. That would be Hitler. And his idea was race. Germany was involved in what he perceived as an existential racial struggle for its survival and racial ideology was at the very core of Nazism, leading to the murder of two out of every three European Jews. According to a new book entitled Hitler's American Model by James Whitman from Yale Law School, Nazi lawyers, as they were developing German racial laws, examined not only American Jim Crow laws, but also our race-based immigration policies, racial aspects of our citizenship laws, and our anti-miscegenation laws. In 1936 article in the newsletter of the Nazi Office on Racial Policy was designed to explain American racism to the German public. It included a map of our entire country with a state-by-state -state analysis of our racist laws. And I want to read you one quote from this. It said, the US too has racist politics and policies. What is lynch justice if not the natural resistance of the Volk, by that the Germans mean the people, to an alien race that is attempting to get the upper hand? Most states of the union have specialized laws directed against Negroes which limit their voting rights, freedom of movement, and career possibilities. Karl Clay, a German judge and professor of criminal law at the University of Berlin, was himself a student of American history and American laws. And at a meeting of legal expert, experts to discuss the development of Nazi racial laws, he referred to our Jim Crow laws as merely race protection very similar to the steps the Nazis themselves were taking. Now, we all know that the Holocaust and Jim Crow South are different events, but they do overlap in time and they both speak to the enduring power of difference, tribalism, and especially race in societies. Both events, and tonight's film about individuals affected by both systems, remind us of two big lessons that the museum teaches every day, that the unthinkable is always possible, and that individuals, every single one of us, always has more power than they realize. So we're delighted to have you here tonight for a very interesting program. Um, after the film, there will be a wonderful panel, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the producer of the film, From Swastika to Jim Crow, Stephen Fischler. It's, it's quite exciting to be showing the documentary here at the Holocaust Museum as part of the March on Washington Film Festivals. There are so many personal connections and interests that this film seems to intersect. But I want to keep the introduction short and really let the film speak for itself. 
From Swastika to Jim Crow, or rather the idea for the film, began in 1994 when we, meaning Joel Sutra, my partner at Pacific Street Films, and I, read a short letter to the editor of the New York Times written by one of the refugee scholars that you'll meet in this film, John Hers. This was at a time when there was much in the press about discord between the African American and Jewish communities. Professor Hers wrote that he got his first teaching job at Howard University through Ralph Bunch, then chairperson of the political science department. Hers wrote, and I quote from his letter, mutual sympathy as victims of persecution and discrimination united the mostly Jewish refugees who had barely escaped the impending Holocaust with black Americans. The helping hand stretched out by black colleges and black scholars should not be forgotten at a time when, alas, Jewish-black relations have become strained. I will forever remember in gratitude. Professor Hers also mentioned the book called From Swastika to Jim Crow by Gabrielle Edgecombe, who lived here in Washington, DC. We, we quickly contacted Gabrielle, who we, who we then we worked with very closely during the research and production of the documentary. She was an amazing and inspiring person, worthy of a film about her life, which began in Germany, where as a child, she saw the brutality of racism. She recognized that the refugee scholars were part of a small but independent movement at a time when the scholars themselves did not self-identify as a group. The film takes its title from her book and is dedicated to her memory. Joel, whose parents were survivors and who was born in a DP camp, and I, my father was in the Army Air Corps and a prisoner of war in Germany, both felt immediately that there was a story here and we committed ourselves to making this film. And even though the film was originally broadcast a number of years ago, it seems to me that the issues it raises, fascism, refugees, immigrants, racism, and the bond that is possible between people from different countries and cultures may be even more relevant today than when we first began the work of making this film. Thank you. My name is Jill Savitt, and I am the acting director of the Simon Scott Center here at the Holocaust Museum. Tonight, we're going to have a discussion that is inspired by the film From Swastika to Jim Crow, which our, our audience here in the theater just saw. And we are delighted to be joined this evening by um, an audience online who will be sitting in for this conversation with us. So thanks to all of you for being here tonight. So we're about to step back in time to discuss a unique moment when some people crossed paths in our country. Jewish scholars escaping Nazi Germany and arriving in the United States. They confronted anti-Semitism and discrimination upon their arrival. And these professors had many doors that were closed to them. But a few dozen of them found teaching positions at historically black colleges and universities in the segregated Jim Crow South. And while there, they were exposed to racism and the violent treatment of African Americans, including their students and their colleagues. So tonight, our panel is gonna talk about this history, which is very little known, what the African American communities knew about what was happening in Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, the impact these refugee scholars had on the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities, and the impact those colleges had on the refugee scholars. So before we begin, just a few notes of housekeeping. The conversation we have on stage is gonna last about 30 minutes, and then we're gonna invite questions from the audience. For those of you who are in the theater, you received index cards on your way in. We'd love for you to write down questions on those cards and pass them to the aisles where our staff will pick them up and then we will draw from them to ask the questions. And then for our online audience, we encourage you to um, make comments and ask questions using two hashtags. You can use the hashtag, hashtag USHMM for US Holocaust Memorial Museum or hashtag March On. So um, 
it is now my pleasure to introduce our panelists this evening. You might recognize one of them. <laughs> Dr. Joyce Ladner was born and raised in Mississippi, and she has had an amazingly impressive career. She joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, called SNCC, when she was in college, which was the, one of the eras that you saw her on in the, in the film. And she got very involved in voter registration and civil rights advocacy. And she was mentored by some of the leading civil rights icons, Vermeer Dahmer, Clyde Kennard, and Medgar Evers. Um, she got into what I guess we call today good trouble for her civil rights activities and was expelled from Jackson State. And that's when she went to, sorry? I just said that was good. That was, <laughs> she was expelled. And then uh, that's when she went over to Tougaloo uh, where she got her BA in sociology and then she got a PhD from Washington University. She did postdoctoral work in Tanzania and Senegal and then was a professor of sociology at Hunter College CUNY Graduate Center and Howard University, where she was also the provost and the interim president. She was also a presidential uh, appointee to the DC Financial Control Board and a senior fellow at Brookings. Um, she's written many books, and they include Tomorrow's Tomorrow, The Black Woman, Mixed Families, Adopting, Ra Adopting Across Racial Boundaries, and The Death of White Sociology, Essays on Race and Culture. We are delighted also to have Hank Klibanoff tonight, who joins us. He uh, grew up in a Jewish family in Alabama. He went and studied English at Washington University, got a BA, and then a master's at um, Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern. He put that education to very good use because he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize for a book he co-authored, The Race Beat, The Press, The Civil Rights Struggle, and The Awakening of a Nation. He's currently a professor of, of creative writing and nonfiction at Emory University in Atlanta, and is the director of the Georgia Civil Rights Cold Cases Project, which fills in the historical gaps and corrects myths about unsolved racial murders from the civil rights era. And the project exposes these cases, um, brings reconciliation in some cases, and even prosecutions for these unsolved crimes. And I think something you all should check out is an amazing podcast that Hank hosts called Buried Truths. Write that down right now, um, and it's, a, it's about racial tensions in Georgia during and after the 1948 presidential election, uh, governor's election, yeah. So I, I checked it out two weeks ago, it was fantastic. So we're just gonna get started, if that's okay with you both. So we have these Jewish professors, they flee Nazi Germany, they leave behind unbelievable persecution, they arrive here, they have very little previous knowledge of people of color, or interaction or, or know much about the American South, and yet they, they show up and they come to these historically black colleges. So we have a short clip from the film just to remind us of that moment in the film when we learn about that. Not only are they in a strange country when they go to the South, but they're in a strange country within a strange country. It is a a double exile in a sense, or a double exile experience, because they arrive in New York for the most part, where there are lots of refugees and all these organizations, and then go to the places where the refugees hang out together and visit. All of a sudden, they're in the American South at a time of total segregation and what I call racial terror, because if you break the rules, you are liable to have terrible troubles. So Dr. Ladner, let's start with you. Um, if you could just give us a sense of what it was like for you, you were a, a young girl at this time, what it was like for you in the South at that time, and also tell us what it would, like, what it would be like for a foreigner to come into that community someone like these professors, what would that be like for them personally? I grew up and was born and reared in an entirely racially segregated, legally segregated um, society. Everything was very strictly white or black. We couldn't, this was pre-civil rights, pre-sit-in movement, pre-freedom rights. Um, when I went to Tougaloo College, first of all, Tougaloo, and some of the other colleges, small private colleges that these refugee scholars taught at, had a, a, an interracial history. 
They were founded by the American Missionary Association immediately following slavery for the children of ex-slaves. And uh, Tougaloo did not have a, get a black president until the late 1960s. By the way, one, one interesting thing is that uh, Dr. Beidel, the president at Talladega in the film here, who was uh, at Calvin Hearn said, they kept, they, they locked the, the trustees and the president. Yeah. Yeah, okay. He came to Tougaloo afterwards and was a completely different person. I mean, he was a strong, he learned a lot at Talladega because he was the strongest, most forward, progressive um, president. I mean, he would come down to the jail to see us and, and so on, you know. Um, but anyway, getting back to it. So, so Tougaloo and these other colleges uh, are, were already integrated partially. There was white faculty there. Tougaloo rough, had roughly half white and half black faculty when I was there. So Dr. Berinsky entered into an environment that was not like the wider society out in segregated uh, Mississippi. Um, but, but even so, it was still uh, quite an adjustment to make. They all lived on campus uh, because that was where it was safe. And even living on campus, I remember people shot into one of my professor's homes and barely missed his do killing his daughter, you know, through the window. Uh, it was dangerous. They, could be, they were beaten up when they left the campus um, and so on. So, it, but, but it wasn't a horrible, terrible life every day. I mean, it was, you know, it became a normal life because they were among people who were deeply accepting. It was mutual acceptance. Did, did he, did, would the professors not want to leave the campus because it was so divisive out in the wider world? Did it become a place where people... No, no, they... they at Tulu, I mean, they went out. Dr. Brinska had a little car, a black car, and he drove it about 10 miles an hour. So, <laughs> so he, he was like this. <laughs> he wanted to stay clear of him. Um, <laughs> and, and they had friends. He had friends. I mean, he was in the capital in Jackson, so there were more people, of, you know, people at other campuses. Uh, he must have known every progressive white person in, and black person, too, in all of Mississippi. All three, <laughs> right? So, so it was. They, they. Um, some of my professors belonged to white churches in in, in Jackson. Um, they took us with them, and we got arrested. Um, but, but it, it, it was. A, I don't think it was a. It was not a frightening life from day to day at all. Yeah. So we wanted to try and understand what African-American communities at the time would have known about what was going on in Nazi Germany. We have an exhibit here about Americans and the Holocaust now. And as part of that, we had citizen historians and students across the country try and look at what was being published in their local newspapers. It's called History Unfolded is the project, a massive crowdsourcing project that got some 10,000 articles um, to try and understand what information even small towns would have had access to, and small communities would have had access to about what was going on. So, um, Hank, we're gonna show some articles uh, on the screen, and can you walk us through what this coverage means? Um, what does it say about what people knew about the Nazi era in these communities, and how it tapped into the consciousness in African-American communities? Well, certainly it was, um in some ways, uh, all too easy to try to draw parallels between the Klan and the Nazis. Um, and uh, it was a quick and easy association that one could make. Uh, it's important to say that what you're seeing here is the black press. Um, and the Atlanta Daily World, you know, was a black newspaper in Atlanta, obviously. And white people were not reading the black press. They just weren't. They were just not associated with it because if they had, they would have shut it down <laughs> uh, because they were giving white folks hell. Um, and they were not, uh, the, the, the black press became ultimately very supportive of the war effort in World War II, and I don't want to get out ahead of you on this, but they were absolutely supportive of it, but not without saying um, that the European nations, the imperialists, uh, had blood on their hands as well. And they were very clear about saying, if you look at France and, and England and Portugal, these are not nations that 
you know, acquired other properties with ease. They took them by force. And uh, so they, be, they gave begrudging support in some cases. Um, I think it ultimately uh, keep in mind that the black press had supported, eventually, uh, US entry into World War I. Uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and, and many people had prevailed on them to try to support the war. And they did it with this idea that they would that there would be payback, that should we prevail in World War One, that the soldiers and uh, that that Americans, uh, black Americans, would somehow be rewarded. Uh, they were not, and the black press did not forget that by the time that this pressure is on them to support World War Two, um, and yet they they felt like they couldn't hold out forever, particularly after Pearl Harbor. Uh, I want to point out that just as a, a, a W.B. Du Bois was very important in winning support for America's entry into the war, uh, as was the Pittsburgh Courier uh, newspaper. Uh, du Bois, uh, I just want to read what he said at the time, and I, I'm going to read it to make sure I don't get it wrong. Uh, but he was very clear about saying, you know, if Hitler wins, uh, if Hitler triumphs, the world is lost. If England triumphs, the world is not saved. So I thought that was a really important distinction that you see throughout uh, the black press. Very interesting. Um, I want to build on something Dr. Ladner was saying, that, that these professors came in search of a new home, um, and many doors were closed to them when they got here, but the historically black colleges welcomed them. Um, let, let's take a, a look at the, another clip for some of the reasons why one person thought that was. This notion of man's inhumanity to man was, was not foreign uh, to African American citizens. Um, and so yes, I think there was uh, not as much shock perhaps as, as it would be empathy because um, uh, when you've been through slavery, you're not shocked by anything that, that people will do. Do you agree that it was empathy that led these colleges to, like Tougaloo, where you went to welcome these Jewish scholars? Not entirely. There was some empathy, but most of it had, was very practical. Um, they needed faculty. Dr. Berensky said he was living at the, at the International House at the University of Chicago when um, he looked on the bulletin board and he saw an announcement of a job. It was from one of the Jewish resettlement agencies that placed the refugee scholars. And it was for a job teaching at a place called Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. He said, he went to a map, found Mississippi on the map. <laughs> and, and, um, and then he, he, he let them know that he was interested in the job and they told him that uh, Mr. Owens, uh, who was the business manager and later became president of the college, uh, would meet him, met him at the, at the um, train station. Uh, that was 1947. Dr. Berinsky was the type of person who made the best life for himself wherever he was. It was highly, highly adaptable. Um, so empathy was not it. Um, mutual interest, yes. Um, now, the more traditional blacks, uh, religious Old Testament people would have said that Jews are the chosen people and so on, but that wasn't, you know, you're enlightened, you're on campus and that's a more enlightened environment where people, uh, we, the college wanted to get the best professors it could. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it doesn't come out so much in the movie that these people needed jobs and they needed teachers and it right. was very pragmatic right. matchup. But it was also designed in such a way they wouldn't have gone out and hired just any white people in, in, right. in Mississippi at all. Uh, they would have been much more circumspect. May, may I add one yeah, thing? Um, as, as it happens, I got to know Dr. Berinsky very well myself. I was, my first job as a reporter uh, after graduate school was in Mississippi. And uh, at one point, my newspaper, which was on the Gulf Coast, moved me to Jackson to be the state capital correspondent, and I was shared by my newspaper on the Gulf Coast and the Delta Democrat Times, which is Hiding Carter's newspaper, very progressive newspaper. And I get invited to some dinner parties and generally by more progressive members of the community. And there I meet Dr. Berinsky. And 
Um, I cannot tell you without getting emotional what an inspirational figure he was because he created his own positivism wherever he was. And he, you know, I, it's, again, too easy to say, you know, he was my Yoda, you know, uh, and he had this great laugh, and he, nothing deterred him, and, and he had parties at his house which uh, brought in so many people from so many different ethnic and racial backgrounds, and the food always to match. Uh, and I want to say that later when I moved to Boston and went to the Boston Globe, and he would come there to see professors at Harvard. He knew everybody. And, and I picked him up at the airport, and we spent a day together, then I'd drop him off at Harvard at Professor David Reisman's office, you know. I mean, these are giants in the field. Uh, and, then, and then later, he wrote me a letter, he, several letters, but one of them I noticed, if you don't mind, that it speaks to his positivism. Uh, Boston, as you can imagine, uh, after the 1980 presidential election, when Ronald Reagan was, ele was elected, I, you thought Boston was just going to pack it up and collapse as a civilization, okay? <laughs> this cannot be, and if you remember, so many members of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party lost as well. There was so much angst there, you know, and maybe he thought I would be, uh, you know, infected by that kind of thing, and certainly I wasn't thrilled to see it. But he wrote me a letter, and he says, you know, I just want to write a few words about the election for you. Reagan is now in the White House. The Senate is Republican oriented. The House of Representatives remains Democratic. The Democratic processes were workable in the election campaign and then in the transition from the Democratic to the Republican administration. Things go on, and I am not too pessimistic, maybe even optimistic. And he goes on to explain that sometimes you get more of what you want from the people you least expect to get it from. Mm. Um, and he just, uh, he inspired in that way. He, he used the term stigma management um, to describe himself, that he uh, came from a country where he had been a refugee, um, family was murdered and so on in the Holocaust, and he used stigma and positive application of stigma. Uh, he said he used the negative things, experiences in his life to affect change and to turn them, he turned them on their head and sort of reconceptualized them in a positive way. Um, and I think that, that was one of the things that was a driving force behind him and certainly must have been with the other refugee scholars as well. It, it, I'm curious, when you met Dr. Berinsky, so it was 20 years after he came roughly to the country and had been teaching, 60s, how much did you know of what had happened in the Holocaust as a young person at that time? And how much did you know about what he had suffered? I didn't know anything about what he suffered because he said that in order to function, I have to draw the curtain down. He'd never, ever discussed his background. I learned everything, I, I mean, a lot about him through his oral history interview that's uh, in the state archives now. He had been a judge. Right? Well, I did know that he had been a judge in, in Germany, that he shared with us that he, uh, he um, taught, I'm sorry, he didn't teach, um, that he, he had gone to the University of Chicago, uh, he got his doctorate at Pittsburgh, and his field was sociology of the law, actually. He used the, law, the legal profession and studied sociology. Um, but I was, I was 18, no, 17 when I met him, and he was born in 1901, so I met him in 1961, he was 60 years old. I remember the day I met him. It was the first day, my first day on campus after being kicked out of the other school. And <laughs> now it was great. The reason I was kicked out, by the way, was for organizing a civil rights protest. And that was a noble, oh, just. <laughs> no. Now that was great. And then the dean told us that, he, he said, I know you've been slipping off the campus going up to Mega Evers' office. And I don't, I've always fig tried to figure out how they knew that, and, and we la wait, later talked to that dean, and he, a few, few years before he died, he wouldn't tell us, but I think it was because the office was bugged by the State Sovereignty That's Commission. Right. That was the only way. That's right. Um, but at any rate, uh, Dr. <coughs> oh, uh, the Freedom Rides had occurred that summer, and they had to come, they went to Parchment Penitentiary. By the way, my roommate, college roommate, Joan Trumpower, stand up. She knew Dr. Berinsky. <laughs> it 
Yeah, Joan spent um, what uh, three months in Parchment Penitentiary for being a <laughs> yeah, right, for being a freedom rider. Um, but what I was about to say is that the freedom riders had been released, and the the judge had told them that they had to come back for a hearing. So the day I arrived on campus, I saw all these people sitting out on the lawn, and I wondered, who are they? Who are these people? And, and they said, those are the freedom riders. Oh my God, that was just fantastic for me, because I wanted to be a freedom rider, and I was too young, and my parents refused to give permission. But at any rate, I, later that day, I saw this short man. He always walked with his head down and his hands in his pockets. He was always in thought. And then he'd stop and talk to you and smile. Azo, azo, azo. That's what he always said. <laughs> what does azo mean? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. But you knew it was him. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was his expression. But I w asked another student, who is that man? And she told me, that's Dr. Berinsky. Um, he teaches sociology. I said, oh, that's what I want to major in. So I took 30 credits hours from him because he was the only sociologist on the campus. <laughs> but but uh, um, I, I, I think that my first impression was he was distant. He was, they described how pr the professors were very formal. Yeah. He was formal like that. He didn't, didn't crack jokes with you or anything like that. But he, he was empathetic, a lot of empathy for you. Just, I want to remind anyone who has questions, write them on the cards, pass them to the aisle so we can be sure to get them. Um, what do you think someone like Dr. Berinsky, you know, the, the repression against anyone who spoke out in Nazi Germany was severe. What did he make of students doing civil disobedience, getting arrested? Did he say you should do that, you shouldn't do that? Did, did he? He believed in the legal process. Um, he, he taught us first that, I mean, he, he, he wasn't an activist. He felt that, I mean, I don't ever remember sitting down discussing strategy with him. He, it was a, a kind of abstract, but, but I mean, it was like his classes were the laboratory and we went outside and applied what we learned in the real world. Um, but we knew that he was very much in favor of what we were doing. Um, and he always talked about the importance of using the law to effect change. So when students on the campus, Tougaloo students, sat in to the first city in Mississippi at the public library, I mean, he, you know, he welcomed them back to campus, you know. He, he was a good guy. You know, my impression was that he was also a mischievous guy. Uh, that, and that he took, now this is years later he's talking to me about it, and not in the heat of it, not when someone no. was pretty putting it on the line, but he told the stories with a sense of amusement mm. oh, about what purpose. happened. Um, that he, as if he appreciated the... I, that's my impression, mm. you know, he, in his oral history, I recall, he says, I was, he's talking about himself in, a white, in this, you know, white, white supremacist culture. And he says, I was the opposite of everything they had up there. That gives you some insight as to why I came into Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And he says over and over again, it was really interesting there. I think as a sociologist, he was fascinated by Very it. Much. He was curious about it. And all he wanted to do was peel back the layers to try to understand it before he felt like he was capable of ever trying to stop it. And I think one other thing is that I, I had a wonderful experience with him. And he helped to shape the person I became. But I was a student. I was 17, 18, 17 through 20 when I graduated from college. And I didn't know him as the adult. As an adult, he, right. He knew. Different. So right. I would l wish I had known him. At a, uh, he came to New York to visit me. With, and we slept in, you know, I'm a little baby in the stroller around Manhattan, going to the museum and so on with him. And I got to know a little the layer was peeled back when I was his house guest. But in the main, most of what I've learned about him was, was in his oral history interviews. And did oh, you feel like you knew him then, despite? Oh, I knew him back then, yeah. I mean, you know people very well at different stages yeah. in, in your life and their lives. You know? yeah. I know him quite well. 
the, the way I got to know him even better was he would have these parties, invite me, and because he taught summers at Vanderbilt, he would invite some of his Vanderbilt students to come down to his parties, mm -hmm. and uh, he would always say to me, there's a really nice young woman coming here who I want you to really? meet. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And, and I ended up dating one for quite a while, you know, and he was just thrilled, and I did not know how to tell him when it ended. You mean <laughs> you know? Dr. Bariska set you yes, up? Yes, yes. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yes. Joan, can you imagine? <laughs> Okay, we're going to take our, our first question. This is from social media. Someone is asking, what can we learn for campuses today from the welcoming approach of HBCUs to outsiders? What lessons do we have for campus life today, do you think? I think tolerance is one. Uh, you can learn a lot about tolerance, especially during these days and times. Um, we, we, can, um, we need to embrace Dr. Brinsky used the term the other a lot as well. So I think this is an interesting question. Did any relationships develop between the Jewish professors and the local Jewish communities? Oh, yes. Uh, the local rabbi. Mm -hmm. was, Nussbaum. Uh, what, what was his name? Nussbaum. Nussbaum, Nussbaum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and Dr. Brinsky were friends, and I think the rabbi was also head of the Human Relations Council in, mm -hmm. in Jackson. Um, these aren't very big Jewish communities. Well, I would it's assume. more than three progressives. I mean, I heard that it was a funny line, but uh, as a progressive Southerner, I want to say that there actually was a fairly you know, tight progressive. And, and uh, how large was it? I don't know. It, it would expand or contract depending on how great the tensions got, I guess. Right. But there were plenty of dinners there that he would go to where, that where you know, Art Buchwald would come in and speak, you know, or David Broder. He often he had David Broder, Broder to his house. Uh, and you would find not just Jewish, but other progressives. Pat Darian, who later became the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights she under President Jackson. Carter. She lived in Jackson, and she was hosting parties, you know. So there was a community there. And when you say go to his house, do you mean uh, his lab, social science? No, no, his house across the yeah. road. He started entertaining there. He started having, he, he lived there, and he had parties Yeah, I know, there. I stayed there right, with him. Right, that's where you were staying. He had parties there. Mm, because during, uh, when I was in college, I mean, he did all the entertaining in his social ah. science lab, these pictures you see, uh, he had, when he got there in 47, he asked the, uh, some, some veterans who had just come back from the war to go and um, secure you know, these uh, tables and all these old beat up chairs and so on. And they helped him to dig it out and that was where he, he, he presided, you know, for at least 12 hours a day. He had his classes there, he had his office in the back he had his um, social science forums there. He had his dinner parties in the back there. Uh, and, and he served us gefilte fish and strange, <laughs> strange food. That, that, brings up, that, that brings up a question one of our audience members had is, did the, did the students at the HBCUs learn about Jewish faith and culture? And what, or what did you learn about Jewish faith and culture? Besides gefilte fish. <laughs> Not a lot about the, the faith at all, but it was more secular. I mean, there were a lot of, of, of Jewish students in the, in the civil rights movement who came down south. So I had lots of Jewish friends. Um, growing up, there were Jewish merchants in my hometown of Hattiesburg, and we heard that they gave contributions to the NAACP. So it was always a small group, but we were aware of who Jews were, you know. And we saw them as, as being liberal, you know, compared to the other whites around, for sure. <laughs> do you think they learned about, what do you think the professors learned about African American culture? Learned everything, they learned, I mean they were teaching these students who came from you know, all strata, of social strata, um, all kinds of circumstances, and we had students from the north and, as well as uh, stu southern students there. So um, we shared our lives with them and and they with us. Dr. Brinsk is the only professor that I had who was very shut down, you know, closed about himself personally. I mean, he would talk about his work, I'm going to Vanderbilt or I'm whatever, but I didn't even know he was take, that he went to Israel or that he went to China, I had no idea. Someone asked the question, what do you think we can learn from what we saw about how American colleges today are welcoming international and immigrant students and faculty? Um, uh, 
Do you think that the country still has a long way to go in welcoming foreigners on college campuses? My experience is that uh, we've never had so many on college campuses. Um, I might get in trouble for saying this, but probably one of the dirty little secrets is because if you come from China or uh, you know from most of these Asian countries or anywhere, you're, you you have to play you have to pay full tilt. And universities like people paying the full amount of money. All right. Um, so this is this was referenced in the film, and I, I think it's interesting if we can explore it a little more. Did tensions develop between the scholar, the Jewish teachers, and the black students during the uh, black separatism, or more the the Stokely Carmichael? Oh period that we saw portrayed? I'm, I, I think so. My, my younger sister was in college at Tougaloo then. There were three of us went to Tougaloo. Uh, but but um, I wasn't there, so I only know about it secondhand. And I would imagine that would have been a difficult period um, for Berensky and the other white professors. But it, it was a phase that passed on, you know. Um, Black power uh, wasn't a permanent a permanent ideology that permeated the campus and, and stayed there. That does turn it to you, Hank. Between the progressive white community at that time, what was what were relationships that had been close and working together? What were they like? Did they become strained? Um, I, you know, the white community. If you're talking about the, would the white conservative, white mainstream, white supremacist community ever have embraced or, or reached a handout, absolutely not, other than with a gun or a knife, you know, to, to, to the other, uh, black, white, whatever, um, that you were not gonna crack the ranks on that one. And it was just, I think, what Dr. Berinsky understood is some things you just have to wait out, that uh, people will ultimately change or not change, but he could see the, no, the next generation being more open-minded, uh, both on the you know among blacks and among progressive whites, and I think that brought him faith, uh, gave him faith in the future. And I think he had a long view of history too. I mean, he was a European; he was not an American where you, everything is up close right. and, and immediate. Right. So um, that's a good point. So I, think that was I, good. I wish that we could have taken more of the questions. They were fantastic, but I'm going to end with this one for Dr. Ladner. Someone would like to know what your family and friends' reaction was to you getting expelled. <laughs> well, they knew that it had to be a just cause if we... <laughs> um, they didn't really say anything because they raised us to be fighters. My parents were not involved in civil, the civil rights movement but I told my mother once, you always told me to stand up to white people, look them straight in the eye and not blink. But that's what my mother always said. Because if you blink while you're looking at a white southerner, they'll think you're afraid of them. And, and they were all very, very tough, uh, independent-minded black people. So they didn't really say anything. That, um, they, they just... Were they proud? Would you say they were proud? Uh, I wouldn't say proud, no. <laughs> they were glad we went on to another school, and Tougaloo was the, was the only black liberal arts college in Mississippi, and it was a better, you know, much higher quality than the state colleges. So it all worked out well, you know? So um, we're gonna, it's time to wrap this up, so thank you both so much for sharing your thank comments. You. Hank Klibanoff and Dr. Joyce Ladner. I think especially, especially for your affection of Dr. Berinsky, it, he seemed like he was an incredible man. Um, a, a special thanks to the creators of From Swastika to Jim Crow for bringing this story to light. We really appreciate that and getting to see it tonight. Thanks to our online audience, our in-theater audience for joining us. Um, we are exploring the themes that we, some of the themes that we're addressing tonight in the Americans and the Holocaust exhibition that's here. It's an opportunity to go back in time to the 30s and 40s and see what America's, Americans knew and thought and what they did about what 
they knew and thought. Um, we encourage any educators or others who are interested in Nazi Germany, um, Holocaust history, and the Jim Crow South to visit the museum's website. And finally, a very special thanks to our partners in this, the March on Washington Film Festival, for co-presenting this program with us. It's an honor. It's really an honor for us to co-present this with you, and so it is my pleasure now to introduce the producer of the festival, Broderick Johnson, who will end our program with some closing remarks. I know you all have clapped a couple times, but can we just give one more round of applause to the distinguished panelists tonight? My name is Broderick Johnson. I'm the producer of the March on Washington Film Festival. The purpose of this festival is to educate our audience on the un untold stories of the civil rights movement. From Swastika to Jim Crow is a perfect example. The film explores the similarities between German anti-Semitism and Southern racism, and it's extraordinary. The relationship between Jewish professors and African-American students is so fascinating because they were both able to move past their horrific past to create a trusting society on campus. Joel and Steven, thank you so much for your incredible work. And thank you to our distinguished panelists, Jill Savitt, Dr. Ladner, and Hank Klibanoff for an astounding, outstanding dialogue. <clears throat> to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Thank you so much in supporting us and co-presenting this evening's program. Rebecca, Stacy, Amber, and staff, we, we appreciate your willingness to bring this event to life, and we are so blessed and honored to work with you all. I feel like I'm giving a State of the Union <laughs> to my <laughs> To my colleagues, Charlie and Ryan, and also Clark, uh, it's such an honor to work with you three, and thank you all so much for your hard work and effort. Um, this couldn't have happened without your support. Tonight's event wraps up our seventh evening, and we have had such an amazing lineup of programs. Opening night, we honored Sonia Sanchez. Our second day, we shared a full day of programming on the life and legacy of Madam C.J. Walker. Last night, we hosted an event to shine light on Reginald Lewis. This is our second events, event based around the story and legacy of HBCUs. And tomorrow night at NPR, we are screening the, the film First and Goal in the Bronx, Grambling versus Morgan State, 1968. The game at Yankee Stadium on September 28, 1968 was the first time two historically black colleges played in New York City. This game was played five months after Dr. King's assassination. 1968 was such a watershed year of cultural revolution, civil rights, and urban riots, and this game took on an even larger historical importance in terms of race in the United States. Thank you all so much for attending tonight. Please learn more about our film festival at MOWFF.org or hashtag MarchOn, and we hope to see you for the duration of the film festival. Good night. <laughs>